Nothing but the blood of Jesus This is all my righteousness Nothing but the blood of Jesus Glory, glory, this I see Nothing but the blood of Jesus All my praise for this I bring Nothing but the blood We were not created to live stagnant lives, to be stuck, bound, or broken. We were created with a purpose, a calling, a mandate, a mission. Even in these uncertain times, that calling remains the same, to go into the world to make disciples, to share the love of Jesus. This is the work of Easter, the greatness of God, the power of the resurrection in action. What Jesus did has changed us, made us a new creation, given us an unimaginable hope. Grace has taken root. Mercy has flooded our souls, and the promise of eternity has redefined our everything. So why keep all that to ourselves? It's time to put Easter in motion, to make a difference, to share Jesus with the world around us. If your life has been changed, it's time to get to work. Good morning and a happy Sabbath once again, Lehigh family. If you're joining us for the first time this morning, a very special welcome to you on behalf of our membership, our leadership, and our pastor, Dr. Newton Hoyle. Thank you so much for joining us by Lehigh Connect as we worship together. Uh, th th these have been challenging times. This year has been a challenging year. I know for our church it has been. But on top of that, we have been having an awesome year of worship. If we think back to January, we had our New Year's service, and we also had a, a, grand, a grand time of our yearly prayer and fasting. Even though we were virtual, it was, awesome. it was an awesome time, and we closed that off with an awesome prayer and fasting day. We moved into February, we had Black History Month. That was an awesome month as well, too. And March was Women's History Month, where we had a dynamic lineup of powerful female speakers 
who brought God's word to us. And I know that we were tremendously blessed. Now we transition into another month, the month of April. This is the, this is the month that begins our evangelistic series. And I take time now to just ask us to just be a part of evangelism. Everyone has a responsibility to do that here in, in the month of April, April 24th. You will hear a lot more about that. We start on April 24th. But the awesome news is that our pastor is back in the pulpit this Sabbath. He's been out of the pulpit for a while. He's back in the pulpit. He's going to bring the word to us yet again. And, and if you're like me, you are anxious to hear what pastor has to bring to us again. He's going to speak to us on the siege of the canker worm. Tell it to your children as pastor begins a mini-series that's called God Restores. Looking forward to hear your message today, Pastor Hoylet. Let's pray together today. We need to pray together. It's been a challenging 2021. We'll sing praises to the Lord as well. And we join our children in their ministry as they have their children's story. Pastor will also flip COVID for us again. He continues to flip COVID. It's been quite a while, but he's flipping COVID. He's flipping it from the darker side and he continues to show us the brighter side. I'm encouraging you all to continue to give of your tithes and your offerings by way of our website. You'll see those instructions as you always do. And I want to just say it is such an awesome thing to be worshiping. Once again, let me just say a happy Sabbath. Let me say another special welcome to one and all. Awesome to be worshiping with the family of God today. Let us worship him in spirit and in truth. There are two ways you can use the Adventist giving platform. The first one is online. Go to www.adventistgiving.org. Once you get to the welcome page, you will see an input field where you can type the name of your church. Once you begin typing the name of the church, a drop-down menu will appear with a short list of churches that best match your entry. It is very important that you select the correct church. One way to verify if you have the correct church is by the address shown. Once you select the church, you will be taken to the donation page that resembles the familiar tithe envelopes you see in church each week. Here, you will see the areas that you can choose to designate your monies for, such as tithe, local church budget, Sabbath school expenses, etc. The virtual envelope is separated by sections for local church, conference and union, and world. At the bottom of each section, you will see the phrase more offering categories. Here, you can click and a pop-up window will display a list of other options for you to select to add to your virtual tithe envelope. Once you are done, you click the back to envelope button. Once you make your selections of where you want to donate, you input the amount next to the dollar symbol by each specific area. If you choose more than one category, it will automatically total your donation at the bottom of the page. Once you are finished designating your funds, click Continue. This will take you to the next page, where you will have the option to log in, register, or continue as a guest to make your donation. We recommend registering if you are a first-time user that way, your profile information and payment will be saved to make it easier for future use. The second method you can give online is through the Adventist Giving app via your smartphone. First, you must download the Adventist Giving app from the App Store or Google Play. Once you do, open the app. The initial page will tell you more about Adventist Giving and the features of the app. You will be prompted to slide to the right until you see the option to select your church. Once you select your church, you will see the options with the same sections and categories as the website. The main difference is that at the top, just below your listed church, you will see the option for a one-time donation or a recurring donation, which you can select to set up automatic payments. Follow the instructions and input where you would like your monies to go, and the total will be automatically calculated at the end, just like the website. Continue to follow the instructions listed and you will be on your way to successfully donate it via the ease of your smartphone. For a list of frequently asked questions, please visit floridaconference.com forward slash Adventist giving.
Good morning, Lehigh family. Happy Sabbath to you. This is the day that the Lord has blessed. And I know you are going to rejoice in it when you hear this bit of news that I'm bringing to you. I know for three weeks you have been watching this bus running across the screen and wondering, what is this all about? Well, this morning I have someone here with me who will help us to understand what it's all about. It's none other than our dear elder, Sheila Williams. Elder Williams, good morning. Happy Sabbath to you. What can you good tell morning, us about Dr. this bus? Yes, I am excited to do this interview, Dr. Barrett. Um, I want to let everyone know that this bus that is running there every Sabbath is a dire need for the elderly and the pathfinders. And this bus is to work for the elderly to pick up their, pick up their medications, take them shopping, do anything else that they need to do and to go. I ask Lord that you would just help that others will just step in with us and make this bus a reality. Okay, that's wonderful, Elder Williams. It's going to help our seniors. Do you think it will help anyone else in the church? Yes, absolutely. It okay. will help the pathfinders, especially. You know, as they go back and forth, um, they need um, something steady that they could rely on. Mm -hmm. Then they have to go. To camp, right? When they're going camping. Then they're going to camp in other places. Okay. Praise the Lord. Okay. I know I heard also from an ex-women's ministry leader, our own Elder Lot, that it's going to be helpful for the women also when they are ready to go to Camp Kalakwa or wherever women's ministries is going to yes. be meet. So this is wonderful. This is good. So church... Here it is, we have established a need for this bus. And so I, as the leader of the fundraising committee, have been working with my crew and we have come up with a plan which I know you are going to love. Here is the plan. We propose to raise $40,000, which is what they tell us the bus will cost. We mm. propose to raise $40,000 in six months. And you say, what? Are you crazy? No way. Well, yes, we can. We have selected 40 leaders and each leader is going to be responsible for bringing in $1,200 by the end of six months. We are going to end up with approximately $48,000. And we are trying to get the extras because of course we have to pay for licensing and all of that. Your part in this is when the leader contacts you, say yes. All you have to do is raise $120. That's what I said, $120 in six months. Once you have raised your $120, everybody who raises $120 will be helping to put together that $1,200 for each leader. So. Look out for the tithe envelope, write on it, transportation, and put your $120. You can put it $20 a week, or you can put the whole 120 in six months, and we will have our bus. Sister Williams, what do you say about this? I say that is wonderful, and I'm sure that everyone on the Year of Voice this morning will be willing to participate in getting that bus, because that bus is so needy. I hope that everybody would put a united effort in Amen. order to make this materialize. Amen. And I know the Lehigh family, they love their seniors. They love yes. their pathfinders. And the women love to go to women's ministry retreat. So we're going to get this bus. Six months, people. Six months. Hey, see? Six months. And we're going to get that bus. God bless you because he is able and you can do it. Thank you. And have yourself a happy, happy Sabbath. God bless. God bless you all.
<laughs> Hello everyone. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Jesus died for all of us. That's how much he loves us. That's why I want to share the story, Jesus is Alive, for he is our hope. Hi everyone, it's Aunt Fernita. Today's story is called, He's Alive. The memory verse is from Mark chapter 16, verse 15. It says, He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Today's message is we serve God when we tell others that Jesus is risen. Have you ever had some good news you wanted to share? Maybe you just couldn't wait to tell someone. Mary Magdalene was among the first to know that Jesus had been resurrected, and she couldn't wait to tell the world. It was Sunday morning after the most difficult Sabbath of Jesus' disciples' lives. Jesus had just died a few hours before sundown on Friday. His sad, troubled followers had buried him quickly in a tomb that belonged to Joseph of Arimathea. Then they had hurried home to observe the Sabbath. The women who had been at the cross wanted to serve Jesus by caring for his body. They had followed and watched as he was laid in the tomb. They saw the heavy stone rolled across the opening to seal it. They too had rested on the Sabbath, but at daylight on Sunday morning, they hurried to the grave. The burial spices they carried were to anoint his body. Who is going to roll away that heavy stone for us? They wondered as they neared the tomb. They didn't know that an angel had already been to the tomb. With a mighty earthquake, he had rolled away the stone, and he had called Jesus to life in the name of the Father. The women trembled at the sight of the open tomb. Bravely, they looked inside. An angel, shining with the glory of heaven, spoke to them. Do not be afraid, said the angel. I know that you are looking for Jesus, but he is not here. He has risen from the dead, just as he said he would. Go quickly and tell his disciples, Jesus is on his way to Galilee, and you will see him there. Can you imagine the shock? After all that had happened the past few days, the women probably didn't know what to think. The Bible says that with fear and great joy, they ran to tell the others. Can you imagine them dropping their spices? Can you see them running back to town as fast as they could go? Do you think they were full of energy? Of course they were. Do you think they were enthusiastic? Without a doubt. Nothing could stop them. They had to share the good news Jesus had risen from the dead. We have the honor of sharing that same message with the world today. Before he left earth to return to heaven, Jesus spoke to his followers, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so, little ones to Him belong, they are weak but He is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, he who died, heaven's gate to open wide, he will wash away my sin, let his little child come in. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves 
Welcome to another inspirational moment, the brighter side of COVID. Just flip it and you will find it. Today's segment is entitled, Approaching the Bend in the Road. So today we turn the page from the darker side of COVID and shine the light on the brighter side of vaccine success. Despite the fact that upwards of 154 million vaccines have been administered from earlier this week, the COVID-19 crisis has reached a difficult turn on the road to success. A number of states are summarily relaxing the guidelines which are still necessary to keep hope alive. Serious reversions have been effected such as the discarding of the previously encouraged and mandated wearing of masks. Anxiety has been the nemesis of patience and otherwise sensible thinking for the common good. The CDC director emotionally pleaded with governors and the general populace to wear, to keep wearing masks and washing hands. Evidence of the lack of carefulness among many have collided with the mutating variants of the coronavirus which threatens a fourth wave of infections in the United States. These viruses, these variants, are coming from overseas and rapidly taking over the country right about now. B117 is the more common, rapid, rising, dangerous variant now. And it's spreading in a very big way across the states, including Georgia and, yes, Florida. More states have been added to that small list, thus the list is growing since this past week. Cases and hospitalizations are surging in Michigan, for example. More cases lead to more hospitalizations. More hospitalizations leads to more deaths. Copious transmissions lists are growing and getting larger. These copious transmission lists means that there are more mutations. That's the darker side of COVID. The Centers of Disease Control and Prevention reported on Monday, March 30th, that Pfizer and Moderna vaccines were 90% effective after two doses. The CDC, in a new study, says that in real-world conditions, researchers have found that both vaccines were 90% effective at preventing even asymptomatic infections and that both offer 80% protection after the first dose. Mm. These results affirm the findings in the clinical trials for each of the two dose vaccines. More than 56 million people have been fully vaccinated in the U.S., more than the total of confirmed cases of COVID-19 nationwide. 100 million have received at least one dose as of yesterday. That means one third of the population of the United States have been fully vac have been vaccinated at an encouraging level and are on their way to achieving immunity. The CDC has 
declare the good news that all fully vac vaccinated persons are able to travel and move about without harm to themselves or their families. Of course, with the caution of continuing the wearing of masks and the washing of hands. Wolenski of the CDC says, vaccines can help us return to the things we love about life. So we encourage every American to get vaccinated as soon as they have the opportunity. In four to five weeks, we will get a far way in achieving vaccine success. That's precisely the brighter side of COVID. Let's keep on flipping it. Each time you flip it, you will find it. It will put a smile on your face and bring warmth to your heart. So until next time, let's keep on flipping. Thank you. Jesus, I'm
Hello church, good morning again, it is prayer time. We have a lot that has concerned us in recent times, but we also have a lot to be thankful for as we can see God's blessing in our lives. So come with me as we approach the throne of grace, asking God's presence in our worship today. Father in heaven, our Lord and our God, Father, today I come before you, O Lord, interceding on behalf of your people. Father, I ask that you may search me, and Father, I pray that you may remove from me that which is undesirable, O Lord, and fill me with your spirit, not my spirit, but your spirit. And Father, may, may your spirit make this intercession on my behalf, and Lord, I pray that your spirit will translate to your throne the groanings of my heart, which is the groanings of your people. Father, coming before you, recognizing that you are the true, the one, the only God, the God of creation and the God of redemption. You are the God of love, the God of hope. You are the God of peace. All the things that your people seek, Father, you have in your hands. Lord, recognizing that you alone are to be worshipped. Father, recognizing, O oh Lord, that you are the one who is omnipresent. Recognize, O oh God, that you are the one who is glorious, the majestic God the one who fills us with awe each and every day. Because, Father, we, we look to that day. We look to that day when we shall inhabit that which Jesus Christ has returned to heaven to prepare for us, that place as we seek to dwell with you. But, Lord, while we're here on this earth, O oh God, we seek to be about your business. And, Father, asking you now, O oh Lord, to just look upon us, and Father, may you instill within us all your Holy Spirit to guide us, to guide us to navigate, O oh Lord, to navigate this world. Things are treacherous, O oh God. And Father, we are challenged on every side. But Father, asking for your presence, O oh Lord, because we know that when we are in your presence, Lord, we can smile at the storm. You did not promise us that there won't be storms, but we know, Lord, as long as you are in the vessel, as long as you are in the vessel, we shall not be consumed. So, Father, may we know that you are with us today. Because, God, there are so many of your people who are in need of your presence, in need of your presence for different reasons. Father, there are those among us, O oh Lord, who are hurting hurting emotionally, O oh Lord. There are so many who have lost loved ones. Father, this year has not been kind to the Lehi family, O oh Lord, as we think about those who we have lost. Father, there are many who are still mourning today. But Father, may your presence continue to be with them as your peace consumes them. And Father, may you be their comfort. But Father, may we at the same time not lose sight of the fact that you are blessing. And Father, that you, as you comfort, O oh God, that you reassure. That you are still the foundation of this life. So Father, may you remind them that as they mourn, O oh God, that as they mourn, they can see your light in their darkness. Father, there are some, O oh Lord, who are hurting because 
We do not have jobs, O oh Lord. There are some who are hurting, O oh God, because of what is happening in our world. And Father, they are unable to see their light at the end of the tunnel. But Father, I pray that each person will be reminded that you are the awesome God, the God of all things. You are the God of all needs. Father, you are the God who dispels all doubts. You are the light that takes away our darkness. So Father, I pray that each heart will be comforted today. I pray that each person will be reassured that you are the God who makes all things new. Father, I take a moment to pray for evangelistic series coming up towards the end of this month. Father, I pray for all those who are involved. Lord, I pray for the team that prays for this evangelistic series. Father, I also say a prayer for the evangelist, O oh Lord. May you continue to just, to just cover him and keep him. Father, may you inspire him thusly, O oh Lord, that he may bring your word to your people, that lives may be changed, O oh God, and people may make decisions for Jesus Christ. I thank you so much, O oh Lord, for the vehicle of technology, that we may continue getting your word out in this part of the vineyard and also abroad. COVID has been a dark place, but that is the light when we flip from the dark side of COVID. I pray for our speaker today, O oh Lord, as we have our pastor who's back in the pulpit bringing your word to your people. Father, I pray that you may just continue to hold him up with your mighty hand, O oh God. And may you continue to comfort him, O oh Lord, as he, as he continues to work for you, as he brings your word. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will be with him. And I thank you so much, O oh Lord, for what you have done in his life and for how you have led him. Thanking you for your word in advance, because God, we know that your word is a true word. Your word is a sure word. You have used Pastor Harlot in the past, and you will use him mightily again today. So Father, I thank you so much for hearing the prayers tonight, today. I ask you now, O oh Lord, that you may just continue to bless and Father, as your people call on you, O oh Lord, may you hear. And as we come seeking you, may you be found. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Your is 
Happy Sabbath once again, Lehi. I am very delighted to welcome you to our services today and all those who join us across the world to listen to and to worship with us on our Lehi virtual pulpit. I want to thank the ladies who spoke with us last month and gave us these uplifting messages. I hope that you have taken opportunity along with myself to really benefit from these sermons which we have been listening to. I want to take opportunity also to thank our technical team for their dedication and their spiritual diligence as they worked through the challenges and the tasks associated with bringing those many speakers through the last two months from all over the country. And that was an awesome task. Today we begin another of our evangelistic seasons. I'm delighted to be back in the pulpit today. In accordance with our practice, I generally provide preparatory messages for us as a congregation seeking for our individual and corporate readiness. Readiness, such readiness is designed to focus on our in-reach as well as our outreach. Our evangelistic meetings are always an opportunity to refresh, to reset as a community of faith. And so for the next three Sabbaths, I'll be preaching messages in preparation for these evangelistic meetings with our guest evangelist, Pastor Glenn Samuels. Some of you know him very well. You know what I'm talking about. Pastor Glenn Samuels will be here with us, President of West Jamaica Conference. These meetings, as you have been hearing about for many weeks now, begin on April 24th all the way through to May 15th. These meetings will be held each night except for on Monday night and on Thursday nights. Monday nights and Thursday nights. Let me remind you of the theme of our evangelistic meeting. 
It will be our year's theme. It will be towards restoration. I plead with each member and attendee of our church family for total engagement in the various efforts of advertising and sharing and inviting folks to, to tune in to these messages. Your keen and kind attention will be greatly appreciated. Uh, they're also required. We're indeed living in, in troubling times, brothers and sisters. It is clear to me that we're drawing closer and closer to the end of time. We must engage urgently in preparation for the second coming of Christ. I have chosen to direct our attention for the, next, for the most part of this series to the book of Joel. Uh, scripture reading therefore is taken from Joel chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Please find it in your phones, your tablets, your iPads, your computers. And if you still have a hard copy of the Bible close by, kindly be refreshed by listening to the, the, the sounds of its pages as you turn them to the book of Joel. Uh, verse 1 says, The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear all ye inhabitants of the land. Had this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it, and tell your children to tell their children, and their children another generation. That which the palmer worm had left, had the locust eaten, and that which the locust had left, had the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm had left, had the caterpillar eaten. Our mini series is entitled God Restores. Our sermon text, though, comes from the second chapter of Joel, verse 25. And the Bible says, And I will restore to you the years that the locust had eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. Our sermon topic today is the siege of the canker worm. Tell it to your children. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, help us to discern and to see where we are today in our life experience. I pray, God, that you will come near to us and help us to be constantly aware of the canker worm that is around us. We are desperately in need of you, Lord, for you to protect us, to care for us, and to guide us. May we be submissive in repentance to you so that the power of your Holy Spirit can be upon us, is my prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, turn to your neighbor, tell somebody, uh, don't worry about it. God is going to take care of the worms. Write it in the chat. Let me tell you what it says. Don't worry about it. God is going to take care of the worms. I don't know how many of you grew up in country parts or in the islands where worms always showed up on the doorsteps when rain fell. Or maybe you were just playing out in the yard and you saw worms crawling around. It made you feel icky. Or maybe you were one of those who went with someone who was much older to go fishing in the river and you had to catch some worms to be as a bait. And so worms are also talked about or spoken of in the Bible. Our preparatory messages will bear with them the themes of reflection, repentance, renewal, and restoration. Reflection with respect to the year-long pandemic experience that we have endured. Repentance in direct reference to the terms of the, the major message this minor prophet Joel calls us to. Renewal in context to which God seeks of us and the platform of promise he provides for us in order for us to accomplish renewal personally and individually. 
restoration in terms of what God is going to do for each of us. Yea, he is going to, 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 to grant to us as a people of his church relief from the troubles of this world. He's going to grant us release from the trials of this earth. Right now he's preparing for us his everlasting kingdom of peace and glory, which he will give unto all them who love his appearing. And so this moment, at this time today, we will focus on the repent, the reflection and the repentance part of this, our message, of this, our series. The prophecy of Joel provides the context for understanding our study today. Biblical scholars have sought to clarify for us the fundamental interpretation of the prophecies of the Old Testament, particularly with regard to what we look upon as old Israel, Israel of old, as well as to the church of today. Some of the Adventist scholars in particular believe that, generally speaking, the promises and the predictions given through the Old Testament prophets originally applied to literal Israel. That's what we call old Israel, Israel of old. Such promises and predictions were to be fulfilled based on Israel's consistent obedience and faithful adherence to the word of the Lord. Consistency in their loyalty to their God. Scripture records that Israel repeatedly disobeyed and acted in disloyal ways towards their loving God. Thus scholars assert accordingly that what God purposed to do for the world through Israel of old, he will finally accomplish through the church on earth today. Somebody to be the, needs to be the first to write, thank you Jesus, in the chat. Take your time to just write that in because God, God is going to accomplish what he didn't accomplish with Israel. He's going to accomplish that with his church of today. Somebody write, thank you, Jesus. What is it telling us? The scripture in Joel is telling us, therefore, that much of God's promises originally made to Israel will be fulfilled to his remnant people. At the end of time, I believe that every Christ follower should live in anticipation of this awesome, this awesome privilege of God's promises, the fulfillment of such. So in our scripture reading of Joel 1 verse 2, we hear the word of the Lord speaking through Joel, addressing the men of old age, Elder Wonder, people who are aged, Mother Pearl, Sister Zatilda, Elder Grace, Elder Sheila, questioning as it were incredulously, have you ever seen anything like this before? Tell me, says the prophet, speaking for the Holy One of Israel, in all of your lifetime, did you ever imagine something of this nature or magnitude taking place? Ah, ah, tell me, have you ever witnessed such a calamity? This calamity is new in the memory of living men. Tell me is the menacing refrain. As a matter of fact, did your parents and grandparents ever tell you of anything the likes of this before? Not just you now, we're talking to Joel says, but what about your parents and your grandparents? Did they ever see anything like this before? Joel is told by God to speak to the people. Joel then switches to speak to the grandparents directly. Had this been in your days or the days of your fathers? Joel is told by God to tell the people, tell their children, because this has been unheard of. And therefore, it is something to tell future generations about. Listen to me, Sister B. Tell it to Daedre. And let Deidre tell it to Dana. And let Dana and Avery speak about it to Ella. And then let them tell it to their children. Yes, yeah, Sister Yvette, tell it to your son Terence. And let Terence tell it to Talia. And to Teresa. And to Terence Jr. And to Tariq. And let them tell it to their children. Sister Pam, tell it to Janelle. And let her tell it to Ayana. And so that her children, so that her children can tell it to their children. That's what Joel was talking about to break it down to a special context today. 
What is God talking about? What is Joel directed to tell the children? Ah, let me tell you, for five generations prior to this day in which Joel is asked by God to speak, there had never been a calamity such as this. You see, five generations before in the story of the Exodus, when God brought locusts upon Egypt through this servant Moses, nothing like this. No other such calamity had ever been seen. This was huge. So verse 4 tells us what it was. A terrible swarm of locusts had descended upon the land. It was a frightful, fitful plague. It seemed to have been an odd an orchestrated progressive plague beginning from the early gestation of the palmer worm. It was a progressive development of this family of worms, but it began with the cutting nature of the locust embodied in the palmer worm. The early development called palmer worm appears also likely to be the early development of a caterpillar that almost mysteriously appears in great numbers on the earth devouring the green plants and the herbs and the foliage, just cutting, just cutting into leaves around the countryside. This was known as the cutting locust. Joel talks about the plague, which is followed by the locust, and the locust develop into a creeping, on-winged stage known as the canker worm. Yea, the canker worm, they do not have wings. At least the females don't. The canker worm goes on to the next stage of the caterpillar, representing a destroying locust. The entire plague is a mystery. From scholars, some scholars declare this as the four stages of the locust from the worm into the mature insect. Judah was on the siege by this insect devour, devouring plague. The entire land of Judah is overcome by this phenomenon. Joel describes it in ways that apply to the situation in allegorical as well as literal form. The reality is that the crops, the cattle, the trees, the vines bear testimony to a devastating destruction. Men, virgins, vineyards, and beasts alike is described in the story as being under the siege of this awful plague. Would you like to have been there? I think not. Joel 1 verses 5 to 20 does not spare to describe to us of the horrible state of Judah in this moment of this plague of the canker worms. Hmm. Hmm. The canker worm. The canker worm is still literally a real cause of destruction and distrust today. Allow me to share with you the literal before dealing with the allegorical and in this case, the practical spiritual analogy surrounding God's church today. Literally, if you live in Mississauga, Canada, or North Carolina, or Utah, or the Northern United States, you would quite likely come in contact with an outbreak of canker worms. Ah, there is the fall canker worm, and there's the spring canker worm. Right now in the twin cities of the Minnesota, Minneapolis, St. Paul area, the spring canker worms are getting ready to do their damage. Ah, there's another type of canker worm activity also that has taken place in that very city. But spring worms appear to do their damage as winged males and wingless females emerging during the third week of March in the Twin City areas. Think along with me, think along with me here today. Uh, eggs are deposited as, as loose clusters in the cracks of the bark and under the scales of the bark the text is going to show you in Joel where the bark is referred to as well in the passage. In these parts of the bark, these eggs are not easily seen. And when these eggs hatch, they do unbelievable damage. Trees and leaves are all torn up because, in fact, they are eaten up. So Joel, Joel in Judah, Joel in Judah uh, had saw it all back then. And it is still a rage in discontent amongst the citizens of these parts of the United States today. The picture is eerie. It is eerie. Large numbers of caterpillars spinning to the ground on silken threads, crawling and 
falling on picnic tables and uh, doors and walkways and and the house sidings just crawling can create an unpleasant slimy environment lasting uncontrollably for weeks defying the efforts of even the councilmen of the city nothing can be done at this stage to get rid of the siege of the canker worm that is a backdrop for you that's the need for the so allegorically and spiritually, the canker worm message is that the canker worm proliferates for years just like sin in a given community and in a given company of people. Mm. Thus the need for the repentance of Judah. There's an analogy here. Joel's reference in verses 5 to 7 to drunkards is instructive to us. It seems as if Joel saw the effects of the pandemic upon all sectors of our social society. Yeah, that was a pandemic, all right. In verse 5, it seems, according to the biblical interpretation, that the wine bibbers there are called, they are called upon to mourn their fate. The siege of the canker worm closed down the bars. Hmm? The Bible says it closed down the drinking. Sounds familiar? Yea, deprived of the means of their favorite indulgence. They are urged to arouse from their stupor to shed the tears of disappointment. Verse 6 says, For a nation is come upon my land. Watch this verse carefully. A nation is come upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of lion, and he had the cheek of a great lion. Ah, watch this. The interpretation of the passage is intriguing. I want you to follow me closely here. Biblical scholars again suggest that this passage in Joel seems to be the only place in Scripture where lower creatures, lower creatures are referred to as a nation. The Hebrew word is goy. In other places such as Proverbs 30, verses 25 to 26, lower creatures have been referred to as people or folk. They further assert that it is possible that the reality here breaks through the figurative and Joel is envisioning a hostile invasion of an army of people. Funny how the scriptures can provide an analogous script that often mirrors aspects which mimic similar occurrences in our life experience and occurrences around us. Occurrences such as we saw on January 6th, I see, I seem to see a nation, that's what the Bible says, uh, 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 of, this, of, of this thing, this plague. I seem to see a nation climbing the walls upon the Capitol building in a hostile invasion of said building, invading the Capitol during a pandemic. Could it be analogous to the activity of the canker worm? That's what Joel saw. I came to ask you today to enter into reflection the year this year of the siege of the pandemic. The pandemic has behaved like the progressive destruction of the worms which Joel speaks to Judah about. I know our world has been under a type of collective siege because of this never before seen phenomenon. You and I are privileged or maybe unfortunate to be alive to experience it. But we got to tell it to our children because there's a lot of lessons here. Like the canker worm, the pandemic has been eating out the life and livelihood of hundreds of thousands around the globe. We are reflecting now as part of our series. We are reflecting. Some of us have been fortunate to go far to be yet alive, so far to be yet alive. Ah, but all of us have suffered some sort of loss or the other. Today is a moment of reflection. You see, reflection provides for us an opportunity to debrief and to pause to take a breath of fresh air. Reflection affords us moments of introspection. Reflection provides for us a time in which to take opportunity of inventory of our life and our well-being. Reflection tabulates in audit-like fashion our losses and our gains. Are you listening to me today? Let me cut to the chase. What has been eaten out of your life recently? What have you been robbed of because of this pandemic? 
How has life played a number on you or upon your family, your neighbor, your friends, your co-workers? Has the coronavirus behaved like the canker worm in your personal experience? What is it that needs to be restored in your life? Has love been lost around you? Has life been lost around you? Is your energy sapped? Uh, do you feel as if you have been pressed and pressured to the limit of your abilities and or your capability? Listen to me, I'm asking you today, what has the canker worm eaten? Allow me to ferret it for you. Maybe some in the hearing of my voice have lost their crops. Some have lost their farm. Some have lost their accustomed livelihood. Some have lost their family or portions thereof. Some have lost the love of their life. Some have lost their sons and daughters. Some have lost their parents. Heart-wrenching stories have shared, been shared with you in the new, and with the news about all of that. Sister DeMille's. We ache with you, Sister Carmelita, we ache with you. Some have lost their friends. Ah, there's a mighty lot which the canker worm has eaten. Now there are others who have lost in different ways. Uh, others who have fallen away and fallen out of the fold of safety. Some have lost their faith and, and their connection with the Lord and the church. Some are slipping and sliding down a slippery slope backwards. Uh, church has not been a priority. Excuse me. I want that to sink in for a moment. We're coming to the time when we will have to one day be thinking about getting back into church. Are you practicing to do that? Are you making sure that you're getting up to go to Sabbath school? Are you making sure that you're tuning into the divine service? Are you making sure that you're coming to Yuke Forum? Ah, I don't know about that, but I want to say this, that it is time to begin to practice to get back into the sanctuary as long as the Lord permits that to happen. Some have lost their, their connection with what goes on in church. Some have lost Church has not been a priority. Worship has been eaten away in the home. Personal attitudes and personal issues and personal businesses have taken more time and attention away from connections to church and worship. Personal needs have overridden the responsibility of the temple as in the days of the minor prophets of Habakkuk and Haggai. Personal thinking has been instrumental in eating away of the biblical sustenance that we need. Personal preferences have crept into the Sabbath observances. The canker worm has been eating out the foundations of the home. The canker worm, the canker worm has been eaten away at the very foliage of our faith eaten away at the root and trunk and the bark of our religion, meaning the undergirding and the, and the, the, and the circling, circling of the arms of Jesus Christ that embodies our religion. What are you going to do when the judgment day comes upon you and me unawares? I'm calling on us, all of the members of the household of faith, to confess before God our personal issues. <clears throat> There's some things we need to repent of that Judah is called upon to do. Lay hold on the altar of sacrifice and fall in earnest personal prayer, weeping between the fuse and the altar before it is individually too late. God is able to restore. Oh yes, our God restores. Uh, Joel pointed to the opportunity for repentance in the moment of devastation in Judah. He called for a solemn fast. I want you to notice that Joel calls for this solemn fast against the backdrop of wasted fields and mourning, lands that had been lost, the produce of corn had been wasted away, new wine had dried up, and the oil upon which the country depended as a source of energy had well nigh been exhausted, wheat and barley had perished. Notice where it says in verse 7, that he hath laid waste my vine and bark my fig tree. That's the word there for you. Notice the canker worm likes deciduous trees, they like oak, willow oaks and maples. So when they're through eating the green lush leaves, they lay their eggs in the bark of the tree. Thus a terrible outbreak 
lurks and comes into full bloom in the spring in an uncontrollable manner. I want us to relate this to the difficult circumstances you and I and your neighbors, our neighbors and acquaintances have been, have been through in this pandemic. This, this devastation in our world, such as never before had ever been seen. This is a story we have to tell our children's children. Let me tell you this, that in telling them the story, you have to tell them all the good and all the bad. You have to tell them what you went through. You have to tell them who you lost and what you lost and how the nature was at that time, that point in time. Because children need to know the background. They need to know where you're coming from. They need to know the context of life and how one moves forward in that. Farmers and industrialists have suffered terrible loss. Stores and restaurants, you got to tell them about those closures. Businesses of stirred, sundry types have suffered such as never before with no hope of ever being established again. Are you listening to me today? This is a story, Joel says to us today, that we will have to pass on to the next generation. And the Bible says from generation to generation. Yes, Joel seizes the opportunity to call for repentance and a sanctified fast amidst the backdrop of devastating loss. We will do this in this community of faith on April 14th. There's a solemn fast coming up. We're calling for the assembly of God to get together in our several places virtually and hold a fast unto the Lord. Sister Sheila will tell us more about that in the coming Sabbaths. But Joel 1 Verses 14 to 15 speaks to us today. Joel called for the ministers and for the elders. As your minister, I'm asking you to join me in a solemn fast from April 14th to April 25. A solemn fast, a solemn assembly. Asara from the root asar means to detain, to restrain, used here in the sense of, of causing all work to cease for the purpose of calling an assembly. And inviting all who have not been coming out to prayer meeting to plan to be out on our Zoom platform and our phones to launch our solemn fast this Wednesday night. Join with the faithful who are always there. Let us lift up our hands together in reflection and repentance and renewal in prayer and praise. Let us sanctify ourselves as if in the house of the Lord. The word sanctify, kodash, here means to consecrate and to dedicate. Let us make this time for reflection on our own personal spiritual life. Let us all, as Joel says, do this because the day of the Lord is at hand, according to verse 15. Ah, somebody ought to say amen. Let's put some amens in the chat right about now. The prophet Joel, a minor prophet with a major message, presses the point that the seed in the ground is rotten and the cows and the sheep are perplexed because there's no water and no grass. The rivers are all dried up. Yet the source of the Holy Spirit, thank God, the water of life, which is the word of the Lord, is gone dry from our midst, but we can get it back. Joel was saying to them, just repent and just renew and the Holy Spirit will come back as we call the solemn fast. The evidence of the insect infestation has caused madmen and women and beasts to lose their sense of direction, their sense of values, their character. Everything is gone awry. The nation is suffering this type of dilemma in the midst of the pandemic. No justice, no peace. The governors of the people are all gone delirious because of the canker worm. The canker worm had eaten out the justice system so terribly that there is no assurance of justice for George Floyd even as we speak. There's a lot to keep on praying for. There's a lot to hold a solemn fast for. Have you counted the cost? Have you counted the cost that your soul could be lost? Is there something that says to you that during this pandemic, because of the fact that God has kept you alive, that you need to make sure that your calling and election is sure? Has the pandemic encouraged you to be better instead of being worse? Some need to give 
both body and soul to Jesus Christ today? Has the canker worm done you in? Excuse me. Reflection. Reflect on what has happened over this year, March to March. Has the can canker worm done you in? Or has the canker worm been buffeted by you and by your power and strength from the Lord Jesus Christ? Reflection leads to introspection. So as you take time to examine yourself today, have you lost anything? Have you lost your dignity? Have you lost your self-esteem? No, you did not lose your home. You did not lose your car. You did not, you managed to survive all the payments. Yeah, you had the furs and you survived. But have you lost any dignity? Have you lost any self-esteem? Have you lost any sense of selfhood? Have you lost any self-worth? Have you lost any uprightness? Have you lost anything, anything that has laid you low and you just don't know how to get back up? Because our problems are personal. Our issues are individual. And so there might be something that is not mentioned here that you can identify in introspection, in taking your personal audit as to what may have happened to you during this long, lonesome, terrible year of the canker worm. I return to the pulpit again today to tell you that it doesn't matter what the canker worm has eaten and wasted away in your life because God, God promises you that he will restore. Somebody ought to say amen. Tell somebody, don't worry about the worms. God will take care of them. But there's something you got to do to receive the restoration, brothers and sisters. God doesn't ask us to pay penance. He doesn't ask you to bring a peace offering. No lamb, no goat is required anymore. Oh no, God says, come, return unto me and I will return unto you. Count the cost and come on home. All those who may be listening, those who have not been attending to these uh, Zoom meetings, to these, these, these messages on our YouTube channel, no, you've not been attending to the youth forum. You've not been attending to, to Sabbath school. It is a call this morning for us to count the cost and come back home. Tell somebody, don't worry about it. God will take care of the worms. I remember the prodigal son. He came home to a mighty welcome by his father with arms open wide. That's one of the reasons Jesus told that story so that you and I could, could, could fathom what heaven is going to be like. Satan is defeated. Satan is the enemy of our souls. Has the canker worm eaten away at your spiritual life and growth? Well, Jesus has open arms for you and me today. We've all come to know this year has been a terrible year. And 2021 turned over is part of this year of pandemic. The pandemic has been a major canker worm in the wide open fields of the earth as you know it. Country to country, island to island, nation to nation, kindred to kindred and tongue to tongue, peoples to peoples. Let not anyone join in any theories that would unwisely suggest that it's only America that's having a problem with the coronavirus. I've seen some unintelligible unintelligible type of writings along that notion. The whole world has been painted red, color of sin, but also the color of the blood of Jesus Christ. God knows what he's doing. God knows what he's doing. Indeed, the pandemic has left no country unscathed. It's not just about America, whether by little or by much. The pandemic has brought along with it a bundle of canker worms in its path that has spread all over the land of Judah, the land of this earth. Oh, you may have lost a bundle yourself, but has the canker worm eaten out your soul? And may I ask, what is the canker worm coming after next? I want you to listen to me. Is he nibbling at your desire for worship? Is he nibbling at your desire for church? Is he nibbling at your desire to get on the platforms of worship? 
Is he nibbling at your desire for each other? Yes, I'm going there. I'm speaking to husbands and wives. Is the canker worm heading, aiming at your emotions? What is the canker worm nibbling at right now? Yeah, 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 the canker worm. Is the canker worm nibbling at your children and their anonymous relationships on social media? Yeah, or may I speak to the youth and young adults for just a moment? Are you guarding the avenues of your mind and your soul from the canker worm? Maybe, but God forbid that the canker worm has already taken charge of youth or young adulthood minds with regard to your intellect, your sense of decency, your vocabulary. Has the canker worm been nibbling at you? Does it bother you that, like a bow weevil, the canker worm is hidden in your direction. Ah, uh, <coughs> what has the canker worm eaten? <coughs> has the canker worm eaten your good nature? Has the canker worm eaten your better self? Your best self or your better being? What is it? What is it that our good God has to restore in your life, in your being, in my being, in myself. What is it? What is it? Is it the honesty you once had? Is it the devotion you once cherished? Is it your consecrated commitment to the Almighty? Is it your consecration to the mission of the Gospel Commission to which Christ has called us? Is it your witness on your job to the life of Jesus Christ? Is it your loving kindness and your tender mercy to which God has ordained you? Is it your non-judgmental behavior to which Christ has cautioned you? Fill in the blanks for yourself. You know who you became when you accepted Christ Jesus as your Savior and Lord. You know who you were when you first believed. Has the canker worm nibbled? and being allowed to eat you away? I'm pressing, I'm pressing, I'm pressing today for God to restore what the canker worm has eaten. And so, within the context of the pandemic, riddled with change, challenge, and crisis, the effect is frankly indescribable in a composite manner. So many pieces left to put together, so many prices to pay for the reestablishment of our life, and our living. So many practices and that begs disconnection, readjustment, and embrace. Only a good God is able to put us back together again. God has promised to restore you and me. Somebody said, God is going to have to give you double for your trouble. Ah, Sister Sonia, you know what I'm talking about. Let me tell you this. You see, God has been watching. Follow me closely here now. Concentrate with me. Everybody, just turn your eyes back and focus here right now. You see, God has been watching. God has been looking down upon you and me. He has been looking over you. Ooh, when you thought he was nowhere, yeah, he was everywhere present. God has been taking notes on your difficulties. God has been recording your troubles. God has gone out in front of you and in front of me. And in going out, he has cut back the brambles and then the bushes of our lives so that whereas you could not see your way, now, 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 in a little while, you see the salvation of the Lord. Ah, you and I have learned when the canker worm of the pancreas, when the locust of leukemia, when the canker worm of cancer, when the caterpillar of COVID, when the silk worm of sickness, when the tragedy of death strikes at the doorsteps of your heart, we don't huff, we don't puff. All we do is to stand still and to see the salvation of the Lord. Uh, so I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, because the good news is in Joel 2.25, and I will restore to you the years that the locusts had eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palm worm, my great army which I sent among you. Well... Well, grandparents tell the children the good news too. So that when they can tell it to their children and to their children's children, ask somebody ought to say amen in the chat. Only a good God can restore what the canker worm has eaten. Just tell somebody today, don't worry about it. 
God is going to take care of the worms. Uh, somebody say amen. Somebody write amen, hallelujah in the chat. Brother Duval, somebody needs to shout hallelujah. My question to you is this day to all who have listened to this message, are you seeking the Lord for what the canker worm has eaten? Are you seeking restoration? I'm here to guarantee you today upon the authority of God's word that God does restore. Somebody need to come to Jesus today. Somebody needs to make a decision, a new decision, a renewed decision, whatever it might be, a new decision, a renewed decision. Somebody needs to come back home to, to God, all the intermittent members. Somebody needs to come back. And if there's some intermittents that you know did not listen today or have not tuned in, share this YouTube with them. Share the message with them and have them answer you. Have them write a card down, write their names down, write a request down so that they can come back to Jesus Christ in this crusade. These are preparatory messages. Let us start the practice of re-evangelizing at this time. If there's somebody who I can pray for today, you can put that in the chat. Just write prayer. Just write prayer. Just write canker worm. Just write restore, 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 restore. Just write it in the chat. Restore, restore, restore. God will see it and he will hear it as a prayer of your heart. And I'm going to pray that God will certify that today as we finish part one of our series. Next Sabbath, we'll enter into part two and we'll be talking more about the restoration of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let me bow my head with yours as you bow today in a solemn desire for a fast of the soul. Lord Jesus, I pray that your daughter, your son, your child, your, your long-lost prodigal may come home to you today. I pray, God, that somebody might have heard this word or that somebody will hear this word and make a decision to renew and to refresh today as they reflect on your word, reflect on their lives and apply the word to the life, Lord, I pray. I pray sincerely that somebody may come home to you today and may they call on the phone lines. May they check out the chat and may they just write, I need prayer. Somebody reach out, reach out. As they look at the lines on the, on the, on the tube channel of prayer lines. And so many people will receive a blessing. Most of all today, God, save. Save to the uttermost, I pray. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, I ask these things. Let the church say amen as we listen to the tune, God restores, God restores. He restores your life and he will restore you to his everlasting kingdom. Amen and amen.
Brothers and sisters, we have had another difficult week. Uh, we have had a couple of deaths in the last two weeks, and so we have been mourning the loss of Sister Thompson, as you know, and Brother, brother, brother Emmanuel Ortega. On yesterday, Sister DeMills told me that her cousin had a cardiac arrest. So I wanted to make sure that we remember that today and put our arms around her, give her a text, send her a call, and we will be good to give her encouragement throughout the week and pray for her so she could be uh, one of the success stories. More importantly and more sadly though, we need to, to enter into prayer for our Haitian brethren. There has been a terrible uh, kidnapping of Haitian pastors and members uh, on Thursday night at the, the, the church, one of the churches in Haiti. The Haitian brethren are, are hurting because there have been a lot of uh, kidnapping and, and dangerous attacks on people's lives over the last year. And so they're seeking our prayer, and I'm asking you all as a members of the community of faith to enter into prayer for the brethren from Haiti. I want to thank you for responding to this call and make sure that we do that in our private devotions as well as on our prayer line. And on Wednesday night, we will include that in our prayer focus. So please reach out to our Haitian brothers and sisters and pray with them, pray for them, for this terrible thing happening to their brothers and sisters in Haiti and their pastors. May God bless us as we keep contact with our brothers and sisters here for their well-being. And so I'm going to close out with a short prayer at this time for them in particular. Loving Father, I thank you for the opportunity to pray right now for our Haitian brothers and sisters, for our Haitian pastors. I pray, God, that you would uphold them with the right hand of your righteousness, your sovereign Lord. And our Haitian brethren are wondering why, why is this being allowed to happen? But we know that you are on your throne. We also know that the wicked will not prosper. David told us that. David was assured of that in the Psalms, and we embrace that thought today. We embrace that message today, that you will rise up on behalf of your people, and the wicked shall not prosper. They will receive their end. So I pray, Lord, for protection, added protection around the church in Haiti. May your power, may your compassion, may your blessings be upon them. May your care surround them, and may hope remain in them, in their hearts, knowing that you're the God who sits on your throne and you will bring to pass the judgments upon those who hurt your people. So save those now, I pray, Lord, who are in a kidnapping mode. Save them. Help them to think differently about, about what they're doing. Help them to turn to you as they hear the gospel message. Protect those now also who have been kidnapped. Put your arms around them, Lord. Give them comfort and keep them safe. Keep them well. And may the negotiations that have to go on for their release be successful. And may your Holy Spirit take full control, is my prayer. Comfort the hearts of our brothers and sisters here and those over there. I ask in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.
some soul shall rise Jesus died